then took place. Why did the Air Force not meet their own expectations or the rest of the Army's expectations and the government's? In other words, your, and I'm talking about your function during the war. Look, let me start with no, the microphone, please. The operational concept and the way the force was built. Before the war, we're talking about deterrence, um, warning, and a decisive campaign. Was there? Was there deterrence, first of all? And was there a warning before that? It's very important to learn that for to nowadays as well. Sadat decided that despite the fact that he had it, he was willing to lose a million soldiers, although it would be a restricted war, and he would only move over to that area where he had a kind of umbrella of missile defense. But I mean that you, when you understand that, then you have to understand that the deterrence had only been a partial one at that time. For example, um, a nuclear deterrent is not equivalent to that of, of, of against missiles, for example. The, for example, against uh, Katyushas, for example. I mean, if you're talking about deterrence in the north, it's partial. And this whole concept was already then it failed. And even nowadays, we have to be very careful with this entire kind of concept. He said, for example, at the time, he said, I'm willing to sacrifice a million in order to attain these political kind of achievements. He didn't exactly know what would happen, but he was willing to sacrifice a million soldiers, although I'm going to lose in the war, but I'm still going to do it. And that basically, in the IDF, what is is when you when you fail with your warning, then you, you then decide on deterrence. There was a concept of 48 hours. 48 hours, the intelligence would give uh, would would give a very um, certain warning, and 48 hours is enough definitely enough to recruit and mobilize your reserves. So in other words, here we're starting a war where we didn't have that 48 hours. We had nothing like it. And an additional 48 hours that the Air Force needs in order, in order to destroy all the anti-air and anti-tank missiles, etc., etc., in the enemy countries. In other words, you have these concepts of 48 hours of a warning. But when you start your war it, with a totally different scenario, the worst case scenario in this case, where you haven't prepared yourself for this present war. Why? Because you, the 48 hours of the mobilization of the reserves you didn't have, in the additional time, you haven't actually managed to actually recruit all the people you need. So in other words, you're already fighting with a containment battle, and it wasn't even, even that possibility hadn't been drilled at any point. In other words, there was a specific kind of planning that said, I'm going to receive a 48 hours warning. I'll have time to recruit all my reserves in an organized manner. And then the reserves that come in will be able to move over to the decisive campaign issue. So the regular army should have been dealing with the containment and everything. But 48 hours, it did not exist. So we didn't have the people that we needed. We didn't have all the things that we needed for containment. In other words, what happened? You wanted so much work in the headquarters, in the pit and everything. It was impossible to receive a line with our people that we needed. So, and this is work we're talking about between the ground forces and the air force. And we're saying, we don't. We knew that we d we didn't even know where exactly where the line of our forces were. We didn't know in the south or the north, and that is of paramount importance. Now, why? Because people asked here what was known in the pit in the headquarters, and it was not known at the time. Nothing was known at that moment. The actual air, um, the aerial assistance, was actually was under the responsibility of the, the actual artillery. 
the Air Force was not allowed to actually dictate ground targets. They used to receive that from the other people in the field who used to give the consultants, and they would give out the commands, and they used to join all the divisions. And since we didn't have that 48 hours warning, so of course it didn't reach the places that it was supposed to get to. So they couldn't give us those warnings. And so the people, the artillery in the field, couldn't give us what our targets were supposed to do because they weren't actually in the field. Where we th so we needed to exert an immense effort in order to help our ground forces. So then a center was established for the assistance in with, by the way, with Uri, Uri Sagi isn't here, but if he remembers, we had a kind of um, operations headquarters trying to create the targets because we hadn't received them, because things were not defended. I'm not blaming anyone, but they themselves were in such kind of situation that they couldn't actually give us and they couldn't actually tell us where the targets were. They couldn't give us all the coordination. So everything you didn't have, of course, the, the Air Force had been filming the whole time and photographing the whole time, but, but the, the right people didn't get them. They hadn't been analyzed, they hadn't done. So yes, you can say that there were people that, that had we known what to attack, perhaps we could have had that decisive campaign. We'd have taken a risk and done it, but we weren't actually aware of where we needed to attack at. So therefore, I think that you have to understand that nowadays as well, it's not in the hands of the Air Force what should be attacked. Nowadays, it's much, of course, easier through the digital work, but there's still situations where the there should be a situation wherein the Air Force does decide on some of its ground targets. And nowadays, it's actually improving and things can be done like that. But in those days, it was totally different. And we found all the photographs afterwards. It was all existent, but we didn't know. They weren't actually handed over to us at that time. And those were the first two days that we had. So people were taking risks. There were sorties into areas where there were anti-air missiles and... and and it and they had bombs, but they didn't know actually what they should target. And so this is just part of your of an answer to what you asked. When I joined the general staff as the head of the aerial division in the in May '73, and in that alert kind of circum in those alert circumstances, Benny also was a commander, we didn't have any impact or influence on the commands that we'd received that had already been cooked up and prepared in advance. And I think that there was a gap between the commands that were handed over to us, and that's also connected to that 48 hours, and also to the understanding between the ground forces, and it was a, a gap in the understanding. And I think that that was on what should be done at that containment phase of the war. There wasn't a situation wherein people knew what to do. They understood, let's say, from the various sort of missile attacks and everything and all the comments that they received. They always said that they should have some skyhawks that they should leave on a back burner for if there were issues. And they had actually left those on the back burner, but they didn't quite know what to do with it. But they thought that the regular forces would be able to contain. And what actually happened in the field was that they, some of those um, of that air force um, needed to be actually immediately sent for helping with the containment battles and not for assault. I remember that there was a, a talk that night and they spoke to Benny and he said that the, the forces are going to arrive in Rosh Pina and it's the only person could, who, who could possibly help with the containment is the Air Force. So the question was, who should we attack? And then they said, well, nothing. Anything that's now moving on the Golan Heights is no longer ours. It's not exactly as if the situation was as such. The circumstances were perhaps a bit better. But that was the atmosphere. That was the kind of feeling that he had at the moment, that there's nothing that we can do in the Golan Heights. Our people are no longer there. And I think that the concept of the Air Force at the time was that those 48 hours, we need to get some kind of freedom of movement in the air, and only then we'll be able to move and maneuver. Had 
they allowed us to get to some kind of freedom of movement, then the war would have looked totally different, but they weren't able to give us that kind of freedom at that time. The commands were not implemented. So you can say whether they were good or bad. I have criticism of them, but they didn't actually, they were not manifested, basically. But during the 24 hours, the decision, the decision of the chief of staff on uh, um, uh, the highest state of alert and your discussion with the uh, commanders of the uh, wing and the declaration that uh, now you're at the highest state of alert. Did people start behaving as if tomorrow there's going to be war? I mean, it's a big difference between going to sleep on June 4th knowing that tomorrow there's going to be war and uh, the complacent behavior of those who continue playing cards just before the war. Well, I will... Uh
I was called to Washington because they said they had to give up their time and explain what we So okay, something very important. Now said that he realized that the war is not going to start at the time when he can do it already so he said you should uh, start um, implementing air defense actually the uh, uh, fear was that they might shoot missiles at Tel Aviv and um, by the way they did fire missiles at Tel Aviv but we intercepted them and uh, the war started at 2 o'clock while part of the air force were uh, taking off their ordinance and um, there was some atmosphere of, of lack 
of uh, trust and and part of that was between the different units every unit was being fed from different informations and different pressures and this um, pressure in which the general staff suddenly uh, gave the order to dismantle the ordinance and and the initial um, order was uh, for a strike in Syria and the weather was not was not uh, good and then they started talking about preemptive strike against air bases in Syria um, and then you dismantle the ordinance and then you start uh, running and you know this is not a good way to start a war so some distress begins to build up and this is something uh, not not good to happen and when we started the first Tagaur operation the next day everybody thought that yes you're going to go into war with all the orders that you have in an orderly way and that's it and then the changes started and and the uh, they started talking about the north without the assistance that was required because it's times of emergency and uh, um, aircraft started being shot down and that was a com it resulted in a complete erosion of, of all trust between the uh, soldiers or pilots and the commanders and the uh, top echelons and that it took time for me to recover from that okay and by the way just before the war there's something that we have to talk about some more okay let, let's talk about it now and that's the end of the war of attrition the end of the war of attrition found the air force rather eroded if you think that we got to yom kippur complacent you're gravely wrong that's just not true in the last uh, month of the War of Attrition, we lost several phantoms while attacking the missiles. <coughs> and the main uh, problem that uh, the Egyptians moved all the missiles to the uh, waterline, to the canal line, and the State of Israel didn't react to that. This was not just a political issue. I think that the military was tired fatigued and didn't even want to try and say we're going to attack again in the same place including the air force and you know if you ask me when was it that the missile bent the wing of the uh, airplane that was on the 8th of august 1970 so we didn't get to the yom kippur war complacent i can definitely say that in june july 73 I uh, presented to the uh, general staff, you know, uh, Uzi Elam talked about the note. I uh, presented uh, some standoff weapons against missiles because we were talking already about uh, some weapons like that that uh, would uh, make way for us within the SA uh, arrays, which were still, or batteries, which were still new. We didn't know exactly what they, they could do. And they said to us, it was too expensive no war is expected and therefore we're not going to start development of it. I'm not saying that we could have developed it by then, but let me just explain the general feeling. The feeling was that we don't need this, the regular army is enough, the Air Force will do it to 48,000, that's it.